Welcome, welcome, welcome. Once again, here we are on Worldview TV talk show, the phenomenal talk show. I'm your guest host, the Reverend Dale Smith from FCBC, First Church Baptist Church. I'm here today with a powerhouse panel. These are iconic and all-star figures in the community. So without further ado, I'm going to go from left to right and do see for this phenomenal panel, and then we're going to dive right into our subject. Gentlemen. Oh, Dow Kevin Buford. Poet, author, member of Mount Sinai United Christian Church. Demetrius Carolina, Reverend Dr. Demetrius Carolina, pastor of the First Central Baptist Church, executive director of the Central Family Life Center, and just love to be here. Reverend M. Zidi Hamathiite, the pastor of Wayside Baptist Church in Brooklyn, and just uh, great to be a part of this show. Outstanding, gentlemen. As, as we as we said, family, this is a great, great panel. So we're going to we we'll jump in. Um, being it's Black History Month, gentlemen, and that's Happy Black History Month to everyone. I want to say, the subject of the matter: Does the Black Church still matter? They say Black Lives Matter, but does the Black Church still matter? With that said, I'm asking all of my esteemed guests. Anyone can jump in. Name, if you can name the most significant thing the black church has done since for black history in your mindset. Most significant thing, maybe most significant feat that comes to your mind when it comes to a black church. Anybody can start. Well, the black church has always been there throughout history, mm -hmm. throughout our history here. Uh, we had no place to turn but the church. And thank God that the church has come through in a miraculous way for our black people, especially in times of oppression. <clears throat> the abolitionist uh, movement, the civil rights movement, you, the, the, the black church was always there, and even today, the black church is there. I think Brother Bruford has definitely hit the nail on the head in terms of the history of the black church. Um, I would just simply add that prior to Reconstruction, it was the church that really was used as a tool to keep blacks alive. During Reconstruction, we had more African Americans in Congress than since, and nine out of ten of them were pastors mm -hmm. because the pastors served, has always been uh, by invoked, uh, by vocational in the black church. There's no such thing as a full time black pastor without him also being uh, the local undertaker, the <laughs> school teacher, uh, the attorney, you know, and so the black church has been the the mother has birthed black leaders throughout this country's existence. And so even coming over on slave ships, it was the church, because people often equate the black church at, in America, here in America. The origins of the black church is as old as religion itself, you know, and Kemp, you know, Timbuktu, you know. When we talk about a, a greeting, we often use the greeting of the first real physician that ever lived, and he himself was a pastor, right? So, so let's understand that the world of the black church transitions America. It, it is uh, really the reality of our very existence. And what we must do, like we're doing today, is talk more about that so that our new age black leaders can understand and appreciate and respect the role of the church. Uh, if it wasn't for the church, they wouldn't be who they are. Absolutely. I want to take it back also to uh, the civil rights movement, uh, the significance of the black church at that time, and how our black colleges were uh, formulated in a more meaningful way because of the black church, uh, which we're seeming like we're forgetting now. <laughs> um, schools, um, professions were more focused in the back black church, strategies of empowerment was in the black church doing the, more than just the march or various marches. They strategized, they, uh, even down to 
the voting rights. They strategized, they, they were strategic in making sure that we had uh, lawyers and judges and various people in areas that help promote and empower the black community, which I really believe we need to get back to, mm -hmm. other than just looking f to vote for someone to help us. We need to raise them up again to help us in the various uh, disciplinary areas and disciplines and uh, from religion to education to politics to what have you. And I believe that's the meaningful part that I take back with what the black church has done through the years. But then we need to remind our young people again uh, what that took and how we should reiterate it again. Excellently said, all of, all of you here, gentlemen. It's very profound. But it's a perfect segue into my next question. Um, for those who don't know, I, I, I love hip hop. Obviously, I put God first in all my, with everything I do. But I do love hip hop, and hip hop as purest form. I recently heard a line from an artist that said, only time I do church is funerals. Wow. And while that was disturbing, I also saw recently in, in one of the TV shows, which I won't mention, they portrayed the black church almost in a cult-like fashion, yet raised up Islam in a more spiritual fashion, which obviously is very, those that know me, is very disturbing to me because obviously there are falsehoods, which you gentlemen spoke on. So my question to you then is, how, being known the history now of the black church, as, you, as everyone here has so eloquently stated, how do we take that um, and explain to our young people, and sometimes even older people, the power of the black church and the need for the black church and why is it still relevant? Can I just, just say what a phenomenal question and what a, a, a truly important question. I often talk about systems, things being systematic in this country and really in this world. So when we look at the way in which the church, black men in particular, are portrayed, we really have to look at who controls the narrative. And where, where the media is concerned, the popular media is concerned, it is rare that people of color control the narrative of themselves. Now that we have the internet, we can put more things out about us for us. But the reality is in the popular media, we hardly ever have a say in the way in which we are portrayed. Having said that, there is a concerted effort to diminish the role of the black church because largely many power sources have always sought to control the black pulpit. And because they have not been able to control the voice of the black pulpit, it is something that is a threat to their very existence. Mm. So you will see a lot of media that will attempt to diminish the role and the power of the black church, which will never occur as long as people are attending the black church. We know that a newer population doesn't attend church, period, or religious institutions, period. There's a law in attendance in popular religion across the board. However, we do know in times of trouble, strife, Persons do run back to the pillar in or foundation that brought them over. So the church will never die, but it is incumbent upon those of us because it's a two-edged reality. We who are leaders must lead, even when it's not popular. And persons who follow must invest their time and energy and resources in helping the leader to lead as well. So it's, 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 a, it's a mutuality in terms of relationship. Upon this rock, I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. And uh, the, the black church is part of the church. But you know, just speaking about that, it's, uh, it's ironic because uh, the reason why you have a quote unquote black church mm -hmm. and a white church, which you don't see in the Bible, is because when our African ancestors came over and wanted to worship with the whites, they wouldn't let us do it. So we built our own churches. And you, and you have this segregation within the church, which shouldn't be, because Jesus Christ died for all. And as you know, in Acts 17, it says that God made man from one blood, 
So I just had to point that out about the uh, black church, but God has built this church upon, upon that rock. I love it. And what they've said it all, but um, just to kind of touch on that, um, I'm, I'm still in the civil rights era of time. And I'm thinking of which, which um, is not normally taught to our people and churches and young people in school by the person of Reverend Dr. Vernon Johns. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Vernon Johns was the pastor before Dr. King took over Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. Yes, and he started that revolution of trying to get black people to become entrepreneurs. And he was the first to think about the possibility of boycotting the uh, buses in Alabama. But it didn't go over well with him uh, there until Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, under the mindset of the them all being black, but with a European Western mindset that they felt that because they were rich and had arrived from wealthy schools and things of that nature, they didn't want that kind of mindset. So they forced uh, Dr. Vernon Johns to resign from the church. And their, their idea <coughs> was we need to get someone who's like us, who's educated and even though Dr. Johns was, but who's educated and young and would be able to do it the way we would like them to do it. Mm -hmm. And God has a sense of humor <laughs> because they brought on Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. at 26 years old to take over the church. And he came up with the exact same mindset as Dr. Vernon Johns did and then became successful in having the first boy, but boy, boy Buscott uh, in Alabama. Uh, so, that was the starting point, almost, of the civil rights movement, uh, one of the starting points. And so the black church has always been that powerful and instrumental, and therefore we have been a threat to society until they can't kill us off as much as they thought, so they just dilute us and brainwash us and get us to become neutralized so that we don't have that same power anymore. When a people love themselves, they empower themselves. Absolutely. Yes. And the role of the church has always been that of demonstrating the humanity of all people, but in particular the people for whom the culture speaks. And back to uh, brother, Brother's point about black churches and white churches, out of necessity comes a whole lot of invention, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And so we, we, we had no choice but to create our own institutions of worship. However, those institutions, the need for those institutions persist. So the church will always be relevant as long as there is a need for the church, right? Now, whether folks appreciate the need or not, time will tell. Mm. But let, let the situations continue as they are. And you will see that folks will flee to the, to the rock for which they can stand. Yes, the church will always prevail. Yes, I agree. Well, gentlemen, I wholeheartedly agree. I will say this, though, and I'm going to ask this question. With everything that's been said so far, I believe the objection is we need a, a great objection of black church studies throughout. And even Bible study should have some form of that in each Bible study, should be a black church studies platform. I'm Maybe I'm naive, but I'm not. Am I not seeing that, or am I wrong? I don't see that as much as it should be. So I therefore ask the question: Why not? And when should we should we object that? Do you guys agree with that? I totally sure. agree. I, I, I'm sorry. I, he hit a nerve right there for me, okay. um, and that's why I kept referring back to the civil rights movement mm -hmm. because it has been washed down to the point where only thing we think about when we think of civil rights movement outside of Martin Luther King Jr. is to do a march. What happens after the march? How do we help our people beyond the march? And one of the ways is for the church to get back to, other than just quoting Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, 
understand the empowerment in which they had, the mindset in which they had, and then demonstrate that we can empower through the scriptures with more than just quoting scriptures. Yes, sir. Because we have gotten stuck in the contest of seeing who can outquote the next person, but we're not doing the principles of the scriptures. Uh, God said he gives us wealth. <laughs> uh, he gives us wisdom. And so we have it in the scriptures for free. We don't have to keep going to pay for all these workshops and things. We have them in the scriptures for free to be able to start uh, blackness within our churches. And somebody might say, well, what should we start with? Start with the scriptures. Because based on the whole geological structure, their skin was darker on the eastern side of the world. So start there and then work through. So I, I, I agree it should be instituted. Yeah, I want to say something about the scriptures. To me, that's my biggest issue with the church. I dare say that if you gentlemen go to your church tomorrow and survey, ask people to honestly put up their hands, who has read all the way through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation? I guarantee you it's less than 50%, maybe less than 30% that have even read the whole Bible even once. This is God's word, a precious document that he left us, and we take it for granted. We don't read it. The average Jehovah's Witness can take the average Christian and put him into a doctrinal pretzel. In fact, what made me start reading my Bible more is because the Jehovah's Witnesses got me mad because I knew they were wrong. But I had to be able to defend the faith. And so I've read through the Bible, but the vast majority of Christians have not read through it even once. Not even once. And so there, we, we must uh, make a, a, a challenge to that. And when you think about it, right, you know how we always talk about the fact that when it's time to vote, that, you know, people died for you to have that right to vote, you should be out there voting? Well, I got news for you. People died for us to have the right to read the Bible. Go back and look at Wycliffe and Tyndale mm -hmm. and what they went through and then with the Reformation mm -hmm. because there were people that didn't want you to read this, don't, did not even have a Bible. But we are so privileged now that we all have plenty of Bibles, even have it on our phones. People, read your Bible. You're ripping yourself off if you don't read your Bible. You need to read that Bible. All 31,102 verses, all 1,189 chapters, read it all. I know your Bible. I, I think the tenor of the question, and I agree with everybody and everything that's being said, was about black studies in the church. Yes, and so I'm going to go back to the fact that the Bible really references uh, the lifting of humanity. It does not necessarily come from the context in which we live in America as black and brown folks. It comes from the context of love. The preface of the Bible is love. Salvation, ultimate love. Love lifts, love serves, love sacrifices, and ultimately love saves. And as people of color in an oppressed society, we must see ourselves from the perspective of our God. And God does not see us as a second-class citizen nor does he see us based on the color of our skin. He sees us as a part of who he is. And so when we can see ourselves from a divine perspective through all 66 of those books, <laughs> through the ultimate one word that encompasses all 66 books, which is salvation, right? The fact that we are being saved from us by a source that is greater than us and even from us then I think the lifting occurs, and I think it brings a, a relevancy to a younger generation when they can understand that although religion can be critical, the critical aspect of religion is, are, are the people who create religion and not the divine word of God that is supposed to be the foundation upon which our religious practices are built, right? Because we can look at religion through history and see the oppressive nature of religion, more folks have been killed in terms of religion throughout the annals of world civilization, world history. But religion is one thing, faith, belief, 
in the divine books in which we say we believe, be it Islam, Christianity, Judaism, uh, what have you, those divine books do not speak about the segregative behavior that we see historically. That's human beings and not the divine books. So I totally agree. You've got to know the word. You've got to know your divine book. You've got to look at, look at it as opposed to the historical reality in which we live, like civil rights and the like. But again, it goes back to understanding the divine nature of God's word. Then we all can share in that black, white, whomever. It's larger than just the context in which we live, right? Absolutely. But we, so with, that's a perfect segue again, is that within that concept, though, gentlemen, and again, great answer to that question, um, we use a term, I'm going to change it a little bit, Dr. Mason's uh, phenomenal book, Urban Apologetics, which we're really speaking about now, Urban Apologetics. And those who don't know Urban Apologetics is particularly to our black community. And we're apologetics, which means defense of the word. We're defending in an urban context. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Meaning we're speaking on that topic as, we, as many times as we do. There's a word they call BRICS, Black Reality Identity Cults. Mm -hmm. I won't say cults. I respect for some of the organizations, NOI, Nation Gaza, or Hebrew, Hebrew Israelites. But what's always at the core, Dr. Ellis said, is why is there attractive to our communities is the dignity and identification mm -hmm. that I feel once upon a time the black church, where black church was truly the hub of our community, was in place. It seems to be, and again, y'all want you gentlemen to correct me if I'm wrong, that again, we have a shift now where many, many young people and some older people are looking for that identity to their culture. You know, the word is divine. No question about that, which you're saying, which everyone here is saying. But now, as we be apologists, evangelize, how do we deal with the, the dignity issue? That as African people, that we have not been dignified, but quite the opposite. The black church has served, as the gentleman so elderly stated, as a protector, some, some place you can come run to, a place of refuge, as it should be, which is no, a word. But now, when I, if I'm talking to a young person, Mr. Kevin's telling if I'm evangelizing, say, when you come back to me and say, hey, I don't feel dignified, I don't feel the black church is speaking to that uh, particular feeling of my pain. What say you guys? Uh, you mentioned identity. I want to try to tie that in. And Dr. Carolina brought that up. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking, allegedly, Historically, uh, Harriet Tugman said, I would have freed more slaves if they would have only known they were slaves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. That's right. The problem that I see and the challenge I see, it's difficult to put in uh, a narrative of the <laughs> power of the black church <coughs> and how we can help others if we don't know who we are. Mm. And the identity is important. The tragedy is the black church in America identity has been lost like the very existence of black people have been. We've been stripped of our land, stripped of our name, stripped of our heritage, stripped of everything. And therefore we went to ground zero and, ha and it didn't just start in Western America. It goes back as far as the gecko Roman times. Um, the book they took out of our Bible, the book of Maccabees, uh, that in between that 400 year silence between Malachi and Matthew, um, it goes back to there where, and every civilization has done this, where they have stripped those persons who they have captured of their identity. If we don't know who we are, then we can't propel forward to help anyone because we're still grasping for straws trying to understand our identity. It's imperative that the church comes back as a black church, as a black people, to come back to, because we are the church as humans uh, first and then the building. Uh, it's imperative that we know where we came from, know who we belong to, know our identity and come from the lens of our slave masters 
that we still promulgate today in our black churches. And therefore, that's why it seems like we don't have that ability to help people within the black church like we used to because we've forgotten the power we've had and where we come from. And I just want to say um, we must slay the dragon of white supremacy. Because when you think about it, throughout church history, everybody's been whitened up. White Jesus, white God, white saints, everybody's white. And I mean, listen, I don't have anything against white people, but the people in the Mediterranean area were not white. So let's call it the way it is. But you see, if Jesus is a black man, which I'm not hung up on whether he's white or black, he died for my sins. Mm. That's what counts. Amen. But if Jesus is a black man, then white supremacy dies. Because how could God be inferior? So this whole lie, you know, everybody talks about Donald Trump with the big lie. Well, there's a whole lot of bigger lies that have been told for years. And that biggest lie of all from the pit of hell is white supremacy. No, you're not better than black, and black is not better than white. God made us all from one blood. So we got we to gotta deal with the truth on that issue and the racism that we deal with in the church. As I said earlier, the reason why you have a black church and a white church is because the white parishioners didn't want to worship with us. So that's the whole issue right there, the white supremacy. And we, listen, God made nobody inferior. Everybody, God made us all. We have different abilities and different cultures, but no, no pe people are superior to another people. To agree with what both of these wonderful, intelligent men are saying, people gravitate toward a religion or, and or a church and or a mosque and or a temple to be lifted, right? And when the church because we're talking about the church today, has the ability to lift people from where they are to where they hope to be, it, it then, it then galvani it galvanizes people and it brings them together. So today, after the pandemic, attendance is down across the board. However, the church has been forced to use the same social media that has been used as a tool to destroy it. So the church now has a new tool mm -hmm. to become more relevant. The church today has is discovering that the building is not the sacred ground. The people are. So now the church is learning to use the building to formulate programming, to, to bring in counseling, to bring in supportive services in their community. Today we know that there is a land grab and there's a law in land, especially in urban areas, where the church is rich in land. So now the church is learning that they can do joint venture projects in such a way that these greedy developers don't steal from the church, but that the church powers and tools itself to continue to be what it has always been, a light and darkness. And so they're building affordable housing and senior housing and new houses of worship amidst all of that. And after a certain amount of years, it turns or reverts back to the church so the church can now sustain itself. All of these are realities as to how the church can not only be have uh, utilize identi identity politics, because that's what you're referring to, but also use a strong truth to maintain its presence in this world. Again, let's not take for granted the fact that the church and the black church in particularly has always been a vehicle for lifting people that are oppressed and are marginalized or undervoiced and under-resourced. And that's, I see as my role as a pastor. And, but I also know that those of us who are leaders are also targets so that we ourselves need support from the very same people that we are attempting to lift as well. Because the powers that be will not often come to our rescue, save the support we receive from those that we are attempting to lift ourselves. I see. With that said, I'm going to start with Dr. Carolina, who's led a phenomenal vigil for the horrific situation in Memphis, Tyree Nichols. So I'm going to ask each of you, being too outspeaking, we're speaking and speaking of truth to power. What is our shooting response? to law enforcement 
in Black History Month as the black church. What's the black church's shooting response? Response to law enforcement totally. And again, tying back to the previous question, some people have said that there's too much silence. Now, those of us in, in the vineyard know we're doing the work, we know that's not true. But it is a, it is a perception. There's too much silence. I totally disagree with it. But I do ask this expert panel to weigh in and speak on that. What is our shooting response, our response in totality to law enforcement? Tyree Nichols' death was totally unnecessary, but it is indicative of a system that is pervasive and has gone unchecked and unanswered for many, many years in this nation. We do know that uh, police officers, by and large, throughout this nation will respond to a call from a community that is predominantly black and brown differently than they will from a call in a community that is predominantly white. This is a fact. That, that no one can deny. We do know, and I, I dare say, you know, I'm going to, to, to take an educated guess and say everyone at this table has been stopped by a police officer at one time or another and been treated as less than human mm -hmm. um, because that is the reality of the, of the world in which we live. Our response ought to be just that. We ought to always consistently highlight what is true, what is relevant, and what is real. Black people are disproportionately arrested, are disproportionately pulled over, are disproportionately harassed. We are over-policed in our communities and under-resourced in our communities. And the church has to speak that loud and clearly, just like we talk rightly so about the Holocaust and the horrific reality of the Holocaust. We need to talk about the ongoing Holocaust that black and brown people are experiencing in this land on a regular basis. We have to create and continue to develop partnerships with all people who love humanity. My skin, my skin is often my sin, is what this country says to me. But I often say my skin is my salvation because I should never be judged by my skin alone. I should also be judged by how I develop, how I have been developed, and how I continue to develop the society in which I live. The church must always lift that narrative because it is the true narrative. And we have the divine force of God on our side to do just that. Sir. There's a way that we ought to do also, other than just speaking truth to power, mm -hmm. we have to sit down and interview power and then be able to infiltrate power in a more uh, conservative, more spiritual, more uh, clear aspect way of doing that. In other words, it's already known as Dr. Carolina said, it is a systemic problem. Uh, but other than running from it or criticizing it alone, or trying to eliminate it, which would be asinine. <laughs> um, we have to be able to, to, again, start raising our own within it, not just to be police officers, because then we just become footmen. The footman has to answer to the higher authorities. It's time to raise them up. And then when we're raised up in it, we ought to be able to not be fearful that we're hurting the feelings of other skin colors if they're wrong. And that's the systemic curse, I'm going to call it, that needs to be broken. Whereas, um, for instance, I mean, it's wrong, and I may get in trouble for saying this, but with the Tyree Nichols case, yes, those police deserved it because we saw it. But how many other police officers that was not of black skin that we saw on video who still running loose until we stop that and have people to pay for their crimes that is noticeable and blatant, we'll always have this challenge. But we cannot keep being fearful to stand up uh, and not just march to get on television. But what do you do afterward? To stand up and then educate and break that barrier that we keep uh, putting before us. Uh, and one of the challenges with the black church 
is unfortunately, we still have the Willie Lynch mindset, the divide and conquer, separate the lights from the dark and the, uh, f the coarse hair from the uh, smooth, nice hair and all those other things, the old and the young. Until we break that out of our black, uh, black churches and say we are one and we're going to work together and then work with others. But we have to first start working together with ourselves before we can work with others. Well, you know, speaking about what Pastor just said about raising our own up, um, the fact that the police chief was a black woman is a big part of the, um, the movement of justice. I mean, she terminated them within a week, I believe it was, after they committed this horrible crime. And the DA, we had the right DA. So that, that's what we have to do. We have to raise our children to be uh, a, a, a chief of police and to be mayors and to be uh, 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 in positions of authority. And uh, you may not be able to stop what these guys did, but you can certainly bring justice when they do it. Absolutely. Wonderfully stated. Wonderfully yes. stated. Had she not been in that position, right. the same thing would have occurred. Right. So wonderfully stationed. Wonderfully uh, stated, um, change is always occurring mm -hmm. because life is fluid. So change is always occurring, but we have to be in the right positions in order to break what we've all said again, the systemic reality in which we live, right? I, I told I think I think our present administration is doing a great job at just that. I mean, we have our first female um, commissioner of police and first person, woman of color, as our police right, chief, right. and she's doing a yeoman's job. But again, family, let's be real. You don't break a historic system overnight. Absolutely. It is a progressive reality. Absolutely. And I'm not saying uh, what we often hear uh, is happening, let's wait, give it time. No, I'm saying just opposite, but you got to speak truth to power, as was said earlier. And so let's look at what's working, and let's look at what's not working, and let's look at the tools and steps toward making that real change. And what a wonderful point given. If you never put people in positions of power, how can we tell our children that they can be something that they've never seen? Right. Barack Obama did a lot. I'm, I'm a former history teacher, and I taught in high school. And at many, many junctures in my teaching career, I would look up at the top of the classroom and see all of the f presidents of the United States. And then I would look at my class of diverse, beautiful, rainbow hues of children, and I would make a statement, you can be what you, whatever you want to be, and, and, and while that statement was true, I had nothing to back it up. Mm. Now teachers around this country can look up and at least see someone who is not a white male in that row of leaders of the free world and say to somebody that looks like a Barack Obama or somewhere close to a Barack Obama that you can do this because you have evidence of that fact. And soon we'll have a woman up there mm -hmm. and we will be able to say it to our daughters and our sisters uh, the same thing. So another reason why um, black history needs to be emphasized, not just during February. And um, the youth pastor at Mount Sinai, uh, Reverend Kelly, a couple of years ago, she said to me during Black History Month, she asked me, would you write a black history moment mm. for the four weeks in uh, February? But before the four weeks came to an end, she called me up and said, Brother Buford, I want you to write a black history moment every week of the year because I'm black all year long. Yeah. And I said, you're absolutely right. And so I've been doing it for the past two years, Wonderful. writing a black history moment uh, uh, about people that have made significant contributions within the black community. And we need to do these kind of things because the schools, right now, they're running away from teaching black history as opposed to embracing it. They're running away from it. And we need to let our children know about our great history. For example, it's the black innovation that built this nation. Absolutely. And I, look, look, I'm, I'm going to quote you and say everybody on this panel is black all year long. <laughs> all year long. <laughs> and, 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 and we all experience being black all year long, right? Mm -hmm. So, so <laughs> what a provocatively powerful point. Right. But sometimes uh, we have to consciously state what... Uh, verbally state what is conscious in our in our own right. uh, realities, right. right? And how we deal with that every day 
may change. It may vary based on what we experience every day. Mm -hmm. I love it. And the psychological, if I could, the psychological challenge that comes with that uh, to our people is if you look at it on a broader scope, just on what you said about us being black, which we are all year long, it's interesting if you look at the dynamics of this psychological setup in this country, it's as if it's set up where whites say, this is our land, and you all are just getting a moment of recognition in it. For example, February, we have Black History Month. We have other months where they have Asian uh, History Month, Hispanic History Month. Have you ever heard of a White History Month? No. And only, so it's understood <laughs> <laughs> that, oh, we'll give you a piece of time in our uh, land, so to speak, <laughs> because we don't need to have a month. It's all about us all year long. Mm -hmm. And so personally, this may sound crazy, but personally, I think we need to stop focusing in on focusing on months and focus in on a collaboration of all peoples coming together to share every month. So I will say to that, I agree, but I think it's important when we look at the uh, power dynamics, because this is what this is, that the you know, pejorative culture is America, which is you know American apple pie, we think of blonde hair, blue eyes, we have to focus, we have to as a often treated subculture make certain that we take time to highlight all cultures, yes, but in particularly our culture, because it was our culture that made America what it is. And if we don't take time to highlight that, then it won't be hit, highlighted. If you don't lift yourself, nobody else is going to lift right. you. So let's not diminish the importance of what was a week and now is a month, and hopefully we'll become a part of the psyche of America. But you understand how powerful this is. This is why critical race theory, which is another term that was placed on this, uh, is really American history. And that, in fact, there are powers to be that don't want their children to understand the reality and the truth of America and why and how America became the great nation it is. So we can't diminish right. the role of blacks, not just people of color, not just black and brown, but of blacks. Uh, men and women of African descent, their role in the building of America. Uh, I think it was our former first lady who said it so eloquently. It is amazing to live in a residence for which slaves built. Mm -hmm. Okay? So I don't know how that's a pen in history, that statement, that will always be there. And we have to do that. We have to use these moments to highlight specifically black folks. Uh, African-American people, people of the diaspora. Right. Without doing that, um, we lose opportunities. And if it doesn't ha just have to be in February, I agree, <laughs> all year long, but let's do it nevertheless. Absolutely. But I just want to say one thing about Black History Month, because some out there may be misinformed. Mm -hmm. And I often hear people say to me, they give us the shortest month of the year for Black History Month. Mm -hmm. Let's break this down. It's a history to it. Carter G. Woodson mm -hmm. started Black History Week in 1926. He started it in February because Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln were born in February. Well said. Over time, it expanded to Black History Month. And so now you have people saying, well, they give us the shortest month. No, they didn't give us anything. <laughs> we took it. It's sort of like it's it's sort of like giving Reagan all the credit for Martin Luther King's birthday becoming a holiday. Right. Correct. No, his birthday became a holiday, but people was going to take off that day anyway. Mm -hmm. I remember as a kid running in track with the Martin Luther King games and all kind of stuff for Martin Luther King was going on right after he got assassinated. So that was going to become a holiday because we deemed it to be so. So give yourself the proper credit and know the history. I love you it. You know, it's not like yeah. somebody just sat up there and said, we're going right. to give you all the shortest right. month. They ain't gave us nothing. That's right. 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 And so now you're getting to the whole point of economic cooperative, yes. right? And so um, we know that through the black church again, most of the movements we've been successful at making had to do with economics. Yes. We, live, we live in a capitalistic society. Money talks, 
<laughs> All right, and you know the rest of the statement. The rest of that stuff walks. And so when we band together and affect the economics of reality, then we can then take what mm -hmm. is rightly ours. No one gives anyone anything right. that they think is going to take from them, right? So wonderfully stated again, no one gave us anything. Right. There's a whole history to this. But it, 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 you don't often have opportunities to educate people in a society of sound bites. So sometimes you got to get, like you do in your wonderful um, skills and your book, sometimes you take some very powerful thoughts right here, this great book. you got to get it. Powerful thoughts, and you break it down into manageable chunks so that a soundbite generation can get, can grab it and use it as a tool for effective uh, upward mobility. Well, you know something, Pastor, a big part of the reason why I wrote this book, I got it all in my little shopping mall, is because as a young black man, the only thing I wanted to do was sell legitimate merchandise on the Staten Island Ferry and support my family, mm -hmm. using rhymes to make people smile, but I was ha harassed, harassed, hounded, thrown in jail for simply trying to make an honest dollar. And I remember one time I got so frustrated, and I tell the story in the book, that I rolled my shopping cart up to City Hall, to the door of City Hall, said, I demand on behalf of 5,000 people who signed my petition to speak to the mayor. Of course, they didn't let me speak to the mayor, but they sent out some official. And I pointed to the shopping cart. I said, you see any drugs in here? Any guns? Any knives? Anything that would hurt anybody? Oh, no, I don't see anybody. I don't. Well, then why are you harassing me for selling this merchandise? And I just, with disgust, just walked away. But um, a lot of stories in here about what a black man, a young black man, wanting to do it the right way, what he has to go through. And that's why I had to record this story. I got it all in my little shopping mall, and the website just jumped off today. <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. The website, DK, uh, bookdkb.com. Please get the book. And the name of that book again? I got it all in my little shopping mall. Well, gentlemen, you're making my job very easy. <laughs> and I have to, I want to thank you first and foremost for that. So the time we have remaining makes me think about something. I had it on my list here, but you guys are so perfectly segue to it. Dr. Umar Johnson, who I think most of us here know, and why me personally, Reverend Dale Smith disagrees with some of the things he said. I do agree with some things he said. He's building a school. In Delaware, which should be open the next few days, next few weeks, whatever, in the near future. And as we stated here in the show, the black church has built colleges. We built other schools. I truly feel at this point in time in 2023, going into the future, that is needed for that movement to even come back even more so in the movement of charter schools the success or not success of them. So I say to you, the relevancy of the black church as far as education, which I know everybody here has a background in, and stated how should we replicate what Dr. Umar Johnson is doing? And he spoke to a psychological profile, to everybody here speaking of, to basically, we spoke of, we're gonna, we're gonna speak of later, of a gentleman that we lost, uh, Mr. Eric Garber, Garber, who was a phenomenal young man, who was a lawyer, but he was raised by the black church. How do, myself and Kevin were speaking this, how do we model that? How do we model the young people? That we know we have a lot of young people in our churches that are wonderful young men and women. So I say to you now, is it time for the black churches, the black churches to unite, to have a school collectively in Staten Island, Brooklyn, Newark, so forth and so on? Your thoughts? That wouldn't be new. That mm -hmm. would not be new. Okay. The black church has had schools. Mm -hmm. Listen, uh, Seneca Village, I can go on and on and on and talk about the great successes throughout American history mm -hmm. where blacks have built communities, uh, uh, cooperative economics, and schools, right? The issue is, um, again, the systemic reality of this nation tearing down what blacks build up, okay? Believe me, this is not new. This will not be a new movement. Mm -hmm. It's not often televised. Mm -hmm. right. 
So sustainability is the key. We can build it. I have every confidence in the black church and black leadership, even those who don't necessarily work well together uh, for immediacy. Uh, we'll work together for long-term success, but we have to also now through technology and the, and the like televise it in such a way that is not torn apart by powers and forces that are helping on destroying whatever work is done by people of color in these yet to be United States. Mm -hmm. Because again, I'm in total agreement to building schools, universities. We have successfully done this in this country through years, but often when the lights, camera, and action uh, uh, it's turned off, there are um, insidious forces that consistently work to diminish the role of the black church and black folks in this nation. So I'm sure we all agree it can be done and should be done, but we have to also work on sustainability of whatever we build. It's not about me, it's about being a spoke, one cog in a wheel that continually keeps rolling. So that when Carolina's off the scene, somebody else can pick it up and keep it going. When Bruford's off the scene, when Hermaphrodite is off the scene, when Smith is off the scene, because we all are here just for a period of time, yes. you know, and we have to do what we are responsible for in our time, but we have to also try to build some sustainability measures so that once we're going, the next generation will have to recreate the wheel because it's already been done. We have the blueprint, right? But what can we do to keep it going? That, I think, is the relevant question for 2023, 24, 25. And I concur with that. Uh, and getting back to, as Dr. Carolina said before, about that economic power, um, if we remember uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Another <laughs> um, example. And the plethora of black city, I mean, black people who build finances and wealth in various cities, the insidious people, I like the way you said that, uh, destroyed it. Uh, if truth be told, and they stop watering down history, Dr. King didn't die for the threat of civil rights movement. He died when he started trying to bring the people together economically. Mm. Uh, they didn't care about civil rights after a while. They fit him into that box. But when he said, oh, no, let's work on a poor people's campaign. Let's, let's be able to empower economically all of those who are poor and oppressed of all colors everywhere. Now is a greater problem. Uh, Jesus gave us the hint that we would have this problem because when Judas started looking at the oil, Jesus said, hey, the poor you have with you always. And so there's always going to be someone trying to create the poor and keep the poor uh, visible and present in order to uh, look at what we're, our system is. We're capitalistic society. You can make all the noise you want to make on Sunday morning. The concern is not all that noise on Sunday. It's what you're doing with the power you amass right. on Sunday throughout the rest Absolutely. of the week. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm with you. And, and that's also the parallel of what Jesus tried to get us to understand, even from the salvation standpoint, that it's not about what we say, it's what we do. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good work. So you got to work. Come on. <laughs> and then glorify the Father in heaven by seeing the work. But we have a lot of people who's not doing the work, they're just praying for the promise. <laughs> Um, well, I was thinking about Oklahoma, too, when that question first came up, mm -hmm. the Black Wall Street. And, in fact, there have been many other uh, settlements <clears throat> around the nation, black settlements that have been destroyed, not just uh, right. Oklahoma. That's right. the most famous, but there's been quite a few, you know, yeah. Rosedale in Florida mm -hmm. and a few others, quite a few others. So, you know, we have to understand that when we move forward, there are going to be forces that push against us always back, you know. So we have to be persistent in moving ahead. So as was said earlier, I think a, a, a major point here at this time in history is talking around sustainable sustainability. How do we tap into networks nationwide so that when 
these developments occur, we have a national a force like uh, uh, NAN, Al Sharpton's movement of NAN, NACP, and other groups like, uh, like that, the Urban League and more, to s undergird the development of black-led nonprofits, such as what I lead, uh, black-led educational institutions, black-led churches and facilities, because there are always forces that are attempting to destroy the work that is, that's bringing to bear some real fruit in impoverished communities, undervoiced and underrepresented. And let me just throw this in for free, it's that great. just because somebody's skin is black mm -hmm. and they hold a title, a position, be it elected or appointed, doesn't mean they're for you. That's Absolutely. right. And I'm always of the mind that whether you're black or white, if you're not speaking on the behalf of the community that I serve, then my role and job is to help the community to understand that and for you not to be in that position for long. Right. So that somebody else can be in that position to sort of speak to what we need, our best interest, and our communities. Outstanding, gentlemen. Well, if I was a, a viewer, seeing what you say, listening to what you guys say, I believe the black church is really relevant. I think we all agree with that. No, no question. With that said, in our winning time, and I do want to get a chance to read the poem, if we could take 30, 30 to 45 seconds and summarize why the black church is still relevant. Everybody can go first. Black folks still live. Black folks still have needs. Black folks are still a part of their society, which means the black church is still relevant. The black church has to produce the black identity, and the black identity produces black empowerment, and black empowerment produces a place in our society where we can be able to not only just be balanced, but to be able to uh, have our own within the midst of this society we live in. And the black church is essential, or any church of Jesus Christ is, is essential because we preach Jesus Christ the only way to salvation. I want to thank you, gentlemen, for a phenomenal show. And we're going to segue into reading a poem to one of my favorite people on the planet, Ms. Margie Garber, who's lost her grandson mm -hmm. to a, tra a tragedy. But I will say that Eric Garber, God bless his soul, was a phenomenal young man, a great Christian, and epitomized what black churches produce. Mr. Margie King. Garvin. Margie Garvin has kept many a kid from starving. Her pots are warm while the meat she's carving. Margie is the cream of the crop. Good food always on her stove top. She's as solid as a rock, a super matriarch. Oh, how I wish I had a piece of her fish on my dish. She raised five sons, and it wasn't all fun. Elton, Darrell, Eugene, Michael, and Kelly. Losing the last two turned her stomach to jelly. Tragedy, tragedy visited her twice, like a thief pulling a heist. Twelve Septembers apart, the news was piercing like a dart to the heart. Margie took great action and twice helped Jesse Jackson. Her efforts were great in 84 and 88. M Margie marched in Selma, also in D.C. Margie is a role model for you and me. Margie is a shining knight who went to jail for tennis rights and took on many other fights. Margie is a woman of great skill. At 78, she moved to Park Hill. Her activism was sparked by the lynching of Emmett Till. Born in North Carolina, she's more powerful than an ocean liner. I'll say it once, I'll say it twice. Margie is worthy of the award named for Tommy Rice. Excellent. Wonderful. Okay. And a wonderful way to end the show, speaking of a giant. God bless everyone. See you next time on World View TV Talk.